Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine Roll TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You'll see even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Anyway, welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Time for how the sausage is made or wine is made videos. No BS, just straight talk about how wine is made. I'm gonna strip away the romance and pull back the curtain, if you will. Be that anonymous magician that shows you how the magic trick is made, not to put down how wine is made or shame anyone. This is just reality. All right, as I mentioned in my farming overview episode, these shows are in response to the healthier, cleaner, or natural wine ads that you've been seeing for months, or at least I've been seeing. Today's show is going to be uh, more in depth on organic farming. So if you're that person buying that organic wine while drinking Diet Coke, this one's for you. All right, so what is organic farming? Well, it's a bit like going back to pre-1900 style farming with modern equipment. So no synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Like those people that insist that music on vinyl record is superior to one on a CD or digitally stored, both have advantages over the other, but also have disadvantages as a matter of preference. So I way oversimplified that example and I make it sound like it doesn't matter what farming method you use, that organic conventional will yield the same quality wine. I might be a bit biased, but I'd say that all things being equal, the organic wine would be the better overall wine, but not necessarily taste better. The problem is that for the vast majority of people, including many industry people, a side-by-side -side comparison would be inconclusive as far as taste. But I'm digressing into something else better left for another time. Let's get into the details of organic farming. So like I've already mentioned, the techniques of organic farming aren't necessarily new. In fact, they are basically the way farming used to be done just in a modern way. According to Wikipedia, it accounts for 70 million hectares globally with over half of that total in Australia. That figure comes from a 2019 article from the American Institute of Science written by Australians, of course, but the numbers are compelling. Of that 70 million hectares, Australia had 51% of that just shy of 36 million. Figures are rounded up here, so the next closest country, well, that's Argentina, with about 3.4 million hectares. Realize this is all farming, not just vineyards. When it comes to vineyards, certified organic farming makes up less than 5% of all vineyards worldwide. So while it might seem like there's a lot of organic wine being made, based on total volume, it's still a small but growing market. The key to this is certified organic, not, someone's, not someone practicing organic farming or using some form of sustainable farming will cover sustainable soon. Organic farming is generally defined as such according to Wikipedia. Organic farming is defined by the use of fertilizers of organic origin, such as compost manure, green manure, and bone meal, and places emphasis on techniques such as crop rotation and companion planting, biological press control, mixed cropping, and the fostering of insect predators are encouraged. Organic standards are designed to allow the use of naturally occurring substances while prohibiting or strictly limiting synthetic substances. Within all that are a couple of outs for vineyards, in my opinion. First, crop rotation isn't required, but is encouraged. Second is the last part, quote, prohibiting or strictly limiting synthetic substances. So the uses of synthetics isn't entirely out of the question. However, it all depends on the regulations of each country as to what organic farming means, even dependent on what crop it is. Or at least when I research organic wine, there are some wine-specific requirements. These could be universal for other crops, however. Without detailing each country's organic regulations, I'll cover the most universal aspects along with using the USDA's guidelines or regulations to supplement. If I have EU or other countries to add, I'll do it. But for the most part, when it comes to wine, 
countries outside of the US or EU will typically follow one or the other, whichever suit best suits their wine to be sold in either or both markets. At least those are those that are exported to those markets. I'll get into some of the label certs a little bit later. But first, a short history lesson. If you've watched some of the previous videos, then you've already gotten a good idea of the overall history of agriculture. But to catch up anyone starting here, we've been doing agriculture for thousands of years without the use of chemicals. While the first synthetic fertilizers were actually developed in the 19th century, they really didn't take hold until after World War II. Synthetic pesticides were created as early as the early 1900s, but also weren't really a thing for agriculture until after World War II. Both, in combination with better mechanization and irrigation, became the standard way of farming from the 1950s until today. It's commonly thought that the organic movement actually started in 1921 with the husband and wife team of Albert and Gabrielle Howard. They were botanists who founded the Institute of Plant Industry to improve traditional farming methods in India. Many of these techniques focus on crop rotation, erosion prevention, and use of compost and manures. They took their experience in India back to England in the 1930s to promote the system of organic agriculture. So no, it wasn't your hippie parents or grandparents in the 1960s who created it. Additionally, we are kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but in 1924, Rudolf Steiner came along with what I consider mysticism or just flat out pseudoscience of astrology and its influence on agriculture. However, this is tied to the use of conventional farming at the time that was already using synthetic fertilizers and the negative effects of them. We'll talk more about Steiner after the set of videos on organics when we cover biodynamics. Over the next few decades, others contributed to the idea of organic farming. This culminated in 1970 with Charles Walters, founder of Acres Magazine, to describe agriculture which does not use man-made molecules of toxic rescue chemistry. Effectively, another name for organic agriculture. During this time, the counterculture of the 1960s helped fuel a more natural way of life. When it comes to the term organic, it's typically used to refer to the use of organic matter derived from plant compost and animal manures to improve the hummus content of soils. In this context, hummus isn't chickpeas. That's with two M's. Here, hummus is defined as such, directly from Wikipedia, though a lot of what I just covered came from there too. Quote, in soil science, hummus denominates the fraction of soil organic matter that is amorphous and without the, quote, cellular cake structure characteristic of plants, microorganisms, or animals. Hummus significantly affects the bulk density of soil and contributes to the, its retention of moisture and nutrients. Although the term hummus and compost are informally used interchangeably, they are distinct soil components with different origins. Hummus is created through anaerobic fermentation, while compost is a result of aerobic decomposition. In agriculture, hummus sometimes is also used to describe mature or natural compost extracted from a woodland or other spontaneous source for use as a soil conditioner. It is also used to describe a topsoil horizon that contains organic matter, end quote for all that. So hummus and compost are essentially two sides of the same coin. Both contribute to the health of the soil, but are made entirely differently. There are five parts of organic farming that are relevant for us as far as viticulture. Crop diversity, soil management, weed management, controlling other organisms, and genetic modification. For most farms, this is associated with crop rotation. In the vineyard, we don't typically practice that. It can be done, but it's not something that can be done each year. Since a grapevine takes a minimum of three years to produce grapes capable of producing a drinkable wine, you can't do a frequent rotation. And the reality is those vines need closer to five to seven years to produce quality rather than drinkable wine. The older, the better is the general rule when it comes to vines. So once you pull those vines, it's a minimum of four years before that plot can be used to make wine. And that's money, especially if the crop you plant for one year is something you don't really have a market for. What is usually done in a vineyard is plant a cover crop. Clover is one of the most popular, but several other plants are also used. Cover crops are used on regular farms, but in viticulture and other forms of agriculture where the crop takes years to grow and mature, cover crops serve the same purpose. A cover crop can serve multiple functions simultaneously. 
Cover crops manage soil erosion, soil fertility, soil quality, water, weeds, pests, disease, biodiversity, and wildlife in an agroecosystem and ecological system managed and shaped by humans. Cover crops may be an off-season crop planted after harvesting, the cash crop. They may grow over winter. For soil erosion, the cover crop prevents runoff. As far as soil fertility, the right cover crop needs to be planted to balance the nutrients removed by the grapevine. This crop can actually help replenish those nutrients, especially if it is tilled back into the soil. Some cover crops are only used during the off season and then tilled into the soil at some point during the growing season. When it comes to water, a cover crop competes with the vines, so that helps regulate how much water a vine will consume. The idea is to have the, the vine only take in as much water as needed and not more. Cover crops also help with weed management. Since they are already established in the vineyard, it's more difficult for weeds to take root. Cover crops can also be a lure, if you will, for pests. The pests aren't going for the cover crop. Instead, other insects and other bugs are attracted to the cover crop. In turn, they act as predators to insects and bugs that will harm the vines directly or through disease. All this combines to create a beneficial ecosystem in the vineyard. So we've covered how cover crops can assist with the soil and really a host of other things. Besides a cover crop, there are other ways to handle soil management. Let's turn to Wikipedia again for this. Quote, organic farming relies more heavily on the natural breakdown of organic matter than the average conventional farm, using techniques like green manure and composting to replace nutrients taken from the soil by previous crops. This biological process driven by microorganisms such as uh, mycorrhiza and earthworms releases nutrients available to the plants throughout the growing season. Yeah, sometimes these technical words get me. Anyway, so this organic matter in the vineyard is essential for the health of the soil. It's a natural fertilizer. Instead of just putting the elemental nutrients into the ground, you're contributing to the entire ecosystem, allowing things like bacteria and earthworms to live in the soil. Earthworms provide a natural aeration of the soil. Winemakers can also take the stems from the grape bunches and add them to their compost pile. Assuming they don't use them in the winemaking process, or even so, once the grape must is done, that material gets added to the compost to be used in the vineyard. There are other kinds of fertilizers that can also be added. In addition, potash will sometimes be used in order to replenish potassium. When it comes to weed management, the goal of organic farming is weed suppression rather than completely eliminated weeds. Cover crops. Yes, again, cover crops provide another vital function to organic farming. Tillage. Turning the soil between crops. This is not as common in vineyards if the purpose of tilling the soil is to plant new crops. There's also some debate as to the value of tillage. It's possible it doesn't help and actually encourages soil erosion. Additionally, there is another concern that excessive tillage can release trapped CO2. I'll address that in a bit. Mowing and cutting, flame weeding and thermal weeding, basically using heat to kill weeds. Mulching, blocking weed emergence with organic materials, plastic films, or landscape fabric. Naturally sourced herbicides such as acetic acid or known as concentrated vinegar, corn gluten meal and essential oils. Bioherbicides, these are herbicides that are based on fungal pathogens, not very common at the moment. Grazing, sheep, goats, and geese are the most common. Now, geese was new to me, but I was familiar with sheep and goats. In this case, the animals aren't always used the entire year for weed management. They may live on the property year round, or they may be brought in for a short period of time. Let's touch on no-till farming. I had first heard of this from Brian McClintock. If that name sounds familiar, you may remember him from the series of Psalm films. He became a master sommelier during the first film. He, along with several master sommeliers, resigned his status last year in 2019 due to some major issues with the court of master sommeliers. It's best left for you to research on your own, on your own time. I don't really have time to put it in this episode. Anyway, Brian founded the online wine subscription service Viticol. He specializes in small production wines that are farmed organically or biodynamically. One of the tenets of his wines is working with wineries that practice no-till farming. It's not an absolute requirement, but it's highly encouraged. 
His contention is that tilling releases extra CO2 into the atmosphere that would otherwise remain trapped in the soil. There is some evidence for this, in addition to any gasoline-powered farm equipment that is putting out CO2 also. There is also a concern that tilling releases additional nitrous oxide, which is considered 300 times stronger as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Also, no-till farming doesn't always equal organic farming. Synthetic products can be used in order to kill off, say, a cover crop in order to provide the soil with organic material. Yeah, while cover crops are a big part of organic farming, it's not exclusive to it. However, if there is a cover crop in a vineyard, it's almost certain that there, it's part of organic farming, maybe not certified, but at least a vineyard that practices it. In some places around the world, no-till farming is practiced by 70 to 90% of agriculture in a particular country. In the U.S. it's reported to be 21%. This is for all agriculture, not just vineyards. I cover no-till farming some more in a later episode about regenerative agriculture, so look out for that one. Next, we have controlling other organisms. These are classified as arthropods, or insects and mites, nematodes, very small like insects, fungi, and bacteria. These can be controlled in a variety of ways, such as introducing various predators to the vineyard, beneficial microorganisms, companion crops or pest-repelling plants, biologic pesticides, and insect traps. Many of these are part of what is called integrated pest management. These are only some of the ways I picked the most likely method used in a vineyard. IPM is usually a part of organic farming. Depending on the certifying body, it might, might be required for a certified organic or biodynamic vineyard or a sustainable wine. I do need to bring up something that is or has been commonly used to combat fungi, copper sulfate. We know it as Bordeaux mixture and its cousin Burgundy mixture. So Bordeaux mixture is a combination of copper sulfate and quicklime. The burgundy mixture is also based on copper sulfate, but is combined with sodium carbonate instead. Both are used as a fungicide. They prevent downy mildew, powdery mildew, and other fungi. It has something to do with how copper interacts with the fungi. Both are effective and touted as an organic pesticide, and technically they are. However, there's always too much of a good thing. It has been found to be toxic in high concentrations. Created in Bordeaux, hence the name, in the late 19th century, uh, many years of use there and elsewhere in Europe has created a larger issue, copper toxicity. The Wikipedia entry for Burgundy Mixture says that it, quote, has since been replaced by synthetic organic compounds or by compounds that contain copper in a non-reactive, chelated form. This helps to prevent the acclimation of high levels of copper in sediments surrounding the plants, end quote. A chelated form is just another way for something to form. It's pretty technical and I'm not knowledgeable with that kind of chemistry. It's a type of bonding of ions and molecules to metal ions according to Wikipedia if you're curious. I did a lot of searching on the interwebs to confirm something that Wikipedia said concerning the legality of Bordeaux mixture. I know I had seen several articles over the years regarding the legality of it in the EU. Here's the deal. It's legal in the UK and the EU. However, not every member state of the EU has approved it. This approval in both areas is good until the end of 2025 when the EU and presumably the UK will review it. Remember, the UK was part of the EU until recently, so they probably still abide by whatever laws were decided before Brexit. Anyway, the interesting part is what countries in the EU don't allow it. Most are not known for their wine. However, one is the most famous for wine, France. Every other major wine growing country in the EU allows it, yet the country that invented it doesn't. I've linked to the pesticide property database from the University of Hertfordshire for, for you. This entry was updated less than a month prior to the writing of the script, which was August 16th, 2021. Even so, I cannot find any document that says the use of copper sulfate is illegal in France or any country just that France voted against the reauthorization in 2018. That doesn't mean there aren't any regulations regarding using it. You'll probably see something along the lines of using it in low amounts to minimize the acclimation, uh, accumulation of copper in the soil. I've seen copper sulfate referenced plenty of times as, or, as a spray for organic farming in France and elsewhere since 2018. So I can't be certain if France banned it or not. 
It may just be only use as needed and don't let the copper accumulate in the soil. The point of all this is that we have an organic pesticide that has been shown to be toxic by at least one organization in the EU, the European Food Safety Authority, or the EFSA. This is because, this is because copper levels build over the years, which increases the toxicity of the soil and the resultant water supply from groundwater and runoff into streams and rivers. This is a real concern in places that have used it for over 100 years. And while I mentioned there are synthetic alternatives, organic farming tries to avoid synthetics as much as possible. So in the organic world of farming, GMOs are not allowed. And that's pretty much it. That doesn't mean you can't have clones of whatever grapes you're growing. Clones can either happen naturally in the vineyard or a wine grower or researcher can intentionally cross two varieties to create a new one. In the vineyard, these are mutations that happen without any human, action, human interaction. We can also selectively breed grapes to create different clones, crosses, and hybrids. These are all done in an effort to enhance a positive attribute of a grape and reduce a negative attribute at the same time. So things like yield, resistance to disease, resistance to fungus, grape color, drought resistance, heat resistance, length of time to ripen, less or no millerandage, which uh, this is where a grape bunch has uneven berries and can cause them to ripen at different times, soil preference, and water needs. I'm sure I missed a few, but these are things that wine growers look for regardless of the farming type they do. The thing is with organic, this can't involve doing it at the genetic level. This means that if a grape is a GMO, then it can't be used for wine if you're going to have it, you're going to have a certified organic vineyard. I won't go down the rabbit hole of the debate as to whether GMOs are good or bad in general. There are examples on both sides of the benefits and negative aspects, and these are really crop dependent and how cr the crop those crops are farmed. The upshot is that GMO crops are bred to be resistant to pesticides, which allows those pesticides to be sprayed more often, which leads to higher soil contamination, among other things. Now, I don't know of any GMO grapes being used anywhere. There may be test vineyards somewhere, but I've literally never heard of a wine made from a GMO grape. Well, you most likely will find, as far as GMO, is yeast, but that's getting ahead of the game. So now we know what organic farming is. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using organic farming? I've covered some of these already in describing organic farming, but I'll cover them again along with others. First, the advantages. The primary advantage of organic farming is environmental. Less chemicals being put into the soil, water, air, and frankly, us. Now, don't freak out that you're drinking pesticide in your wine. You're not. Wine growers who use conventional farming don't spray close to harvest to ensure the grapes are safe for consumption. With organic farming, you are limiting this part, mostly. Depending on the type of organic farming being done in any certifications, there are a limited number of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that are allowed. Again, the wine growers will not use them within a certain number of days of harvest. It's not just the lack of synthetics being used in the vineyard. This extends up the supply chain all the way to the, the manufacturer and even the, their suppliers of any raw material. Less is made and shipped. Soil fertility and biodiversity is increased. The soil is alive, so to speak. You have a microcosm of creatures, bacteria, fungi, etc., that live in the soil. They each contribute to the overall health of the soil. This is reduced and even missing when synthetics are used. The vineyard that uses organics is also a, quote, good neighbor. No risk of chemicals leaching into a neighboring vineyard or farm. No aerial spread of chemicals either. This also includes runoff into local streams and water supplies. While the chemicals may not be on the grapes at harvest, the chemicals may be in the soil or in the runoff instead. What are the disadvantages of organic farming? Well, less consistency of crop yields year to year. Now, I, I know there'll be some organic farmers or vineyards will say there's no difference, but in general, there is. Uh, because of the limitations on synthetic chemicals, the vines have a higher risk of disease. It's not that organic pesticides are not effective, it's just that they are generally less effective. This is not a hard and fast rule, but that's the tendency. As I stated earlier, 
there are synthetic-based organic pesticides. These may be more effective than a purely organic pesticide or pest management. If you had a cold and wet year, your disease pressure is much higher. This leads to lower yields. In order to make up that loss, a wine grower either takes the loss or increases the price of the grapes to help make up the loss. Or the wine grower just naturally charges more than those that are farmed conventionally to offset poor years. This is in regular you know, organic agriculture too. There's higher costs involved. This is an assumption on my part, as I haven't seen this specifically mentioned. You'll find various studies that will claim, will either claim yields for organic farming as less or opposing studies claiming yields are not affected or if they are, it's negligible. There is higher risk of losing a crop due to disease with organic farming as the organic pesticides, while effective, are not considered as effective as synthetics, at least depending on what you're using. Organic farming as a whole can introduce higher labor costs. Many organic vineyards limit various farm equipment like harvesters. They rely on hand harvesting. In certain parts of Europe, hand harvesting is required for a wine to be labeled just a certain way. These are usually your higher priced wines, regardless of farming, farming practices. In the winery, in order to maintain organic certifications, the grapes and resulting wines oftentimes need to be sequestered. Not like in separate rooms, just that you can't have cross-contamination between them. Otherwise, how can you call a wine organic? This can increase the cost of making the wines. Most of the time, this means thoroughly cleaning the equipment before switching to organic winemaking. Plus, the chemicals used need to be approved, so you could end up with two sets of chemicals. These all add up to a 20-30% to 30 higher cost versus a conventionally made wine. Of course, that cost gets passed down the line to the consumer. Many will argue, however, that the higher cost of the wine is offset by lower costs elsewhere. These are known as externalized costs. Organic farming is claimed to lower the cost of other things not directly related to wine, specifically cleaner water and air in addition to less, less health issues for employees and the surrounding population. So your wine grower has a choice to make. They can go 100% either way or they can designate certain vineyards as organic or not. This also includes wineries that purchase fruit. Some wineries will practice bio or organic for their estate fruit, but may buy fruit that isn't certified for either. This is where the wine grower makes that decision as to whether to get their vineyard certified organic or not. All these advantages and disadvantages play into that decision. If a wine grower is defining themselves as practicing, that usually means they follow organic farm practices most of the time. At some point during a specific vintage or cross vintages, they had to rely on a more conventional farming method. Normally they had to use a synthetic in the vineyard to protect the crop. Even if you do this just once, you can't be a certified organic vineyard. However, it could also be that farming equipment is being shared between organic and conventional vineyards or parts of the vineyard. Farm equipment and also winery equipment when making organic wine needs to be cleaned sufficiently to prevent contamination of organic grapes. Organic winemaking is more likely to be done under the practicing definition rather than as certified. Practicing has a couple advantages. First is flexibility. If the wine grower does have to use non-organic product in the vineyard, then nothing was lost in the way of certification. The second advantage, or really reason, is that this may be a smaller vineyard and the cost of getting certified every year may not be financially viable. I've had winemakers tell me both of these reasons over the years. Being a certified organic vineyard requires a lot of time, effort, money, and paperwork. For some, it just may not be worth it when they follow organic principles every year, especially if they've developed a reputation as being organic, so why go through all that? Okay, so we have now established what organic farming is as a whole, and more specifically, how it's done in a vineyard. But how do we know a wine was made organically? And what do all these terms and a label mean exactly? We'll get into that next time. For now, I'll let you mull over what organic farming means. I hope you got value from this episode. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe and tell your friends. And until next time, we'll do uh, talk about organic wine.